Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. You've often heard me talk about mean Jesus and how we don't like to see him in the Gospels. And when we see him in the Gospels, we like to either skip over it really quickly or say, well, um, God knows what he was doing, but we never really want to confront it. Well, in this text, we sort of have the opposite. We see what should be mean Jesus, but it's actually not mean Jesus. Just as a refresher. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. In other words, he ignored her. And the disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. In other words, she's getting on our nerves. And he answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Meaning, I came for the Jews, that the Jews would be freed. That the Jews would believe that I am the Messiah. But she came before him and knelt saying, Lord, help me. And then again, Christ says, it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Meaning, she was not a Jew, but a Gentile. And not, even not just any Gentile, a Canaanite. So it was not right to give blessings to those who were not Jews. Now, of course, the Lord said this in a bidding for her to continue. And she said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then he answered her, O oh, woman, Great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. Now when we look at the text, we can see mean Jesus if we want. But he's not actually there. In fact, what we have here is prayer. We have prayer. We are not worthy to come to Christ in prayer. We simply aren't. Who are, who are we? If Christ were standing here, who would we be to come up to Him and ask Him for anything? Who would be the first? And I know that we kind of sort of tongue-in-cheek say, well, when I get up to heaven, I'm going to ask Jesus X, Y, and Z. And that's fine. Uh, you know, that's, that, that is fine and good. But I guarantee you, if he was here in the same way that he was on the Mount of Transfiguration, not a one of you would be up here. You would all be in the back like good Lutherans. <laughs> Even the choir. Because we wouldn't dare come to such a holy Son of God to ask of Him anything. And you know what? The truth is, is that we would be right to do so. We would be right to be afraid of Christ. We should be afraid of Christ in many ways. You won't have many pastors tell you that, but I'll tell you it straight away. You should be afraid of Jesus. He is not your snuggle buddy. He is not your genie in a bottle. He is not your 
a piggy bank, that which you can go and take from whenever you may need something. No, Christ is your Savior, and you are sinners. We have no right or reason to think that we can come to Christ in prayer except that He has had mercy on us and He tells us to do so. And that's what makes the difference. When we pray, what do we pray for? Even the, even the disciples didn't know what to pray for. They had to ask Jesus. Jesus, how should we pray? Jesus says, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Note that there's only one earthly thing that is asked for in that prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Everything else is a prayer for the kingdom of God. That the kingdom of God would be as Christ sees fit. That the Father sees fit. But here on earth, Lord, give us what we need to sustain this body and life. And so while we have absolutely, as sinners, we have absolutely no reason and no right to come to Christ in prayer, Christ says, come to me, all you who are weary and are heavy laden. Come to me in prayer. Christ desires for you to come to him in prayer. And he proves it here in this text. But first, before we get deeply into the text, I want to ask this question. How many of you pray for yourselves? And how many pray for others? Or I suppose I should ask it this way. How, how much do you pray for yourselves Versus how much do you pray for others? I'm willing to bet that it's overwhelming that we pray for ourselves, that our will be done more than we do for other people because we're sinners. And we want what we want when we want it. When it comes down to it, we may look like adults, but we're really spiritual children until Christ grants that we grow up in the waters of holy baptism and in eating his flesh and drinking his blood and hearing his word. Truly we are infants, unable to do anything but cry for what we want when we want it. But this woman, this Canaanite woman, comes to Jesus the Jew of all Jews, and says, first of all, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. She recognizes that he's the Messiah. But he, did, but he ignored her. She says, my daughter has a, a, a demon. She is oppressed. The disciple said, send her away. And he answered, I was only sent to the Jews, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then she simply says, Lord, help me. Out of her, her cry for her daughter, she says, help me. It is not right to take, to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. She comes to Jesus and comes to Jesus and comes to Jesus and will not relent until Jesus grants her daughter peace. 
That's what we are to do in prayer. Come to Jesus and come to Jesus and come to Jesus and pray for our daughters and pray for our, uh, our, our sons and pray for our spouses and pray for us. Pray for our church. Pray for those that we don't know. Because I can tell you this was one prayer of Ann Miller. That Art and Kate Saunders would be baptized. Ann prayed this prayer because I heard it with my own ears. She didn't pray for herself. She prayed that all of her children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren would come to Christ, would come to church. I prayed with her. Anne didn't pray for herself, not even in the last hour. but prayed for others. Just like the Canaanite woman doesn't pray for herself, but prays for her daughter. You go and do likewise. And to further try to understand what I'm talking about here, when we come to Christ in prayer as sinners, there's a word that Luther uses, and it's called, and there's three terms actually, oratio, meditatio, and tentatio. Meditation, prayer, and struggle. These are the three things that make theologians. And every Christian shall go through them. Meditation is on his word. Prayer is, of course, prayer. But then there's that struggle. That iron sharpens iron. And that's why we can see Jacob here praying with every fiber of his being in the Old Testament. The person in this text was Christ, pre-incarnate. Jacob literally wrestled with Jesus all night. Why? Just so that Jesus would bless him. Wrestled with Jesus every, uh, uh, the entire night. Can you imagine that? We who wouldn't even approach him, wrestling Christ all night long. And then Jesus saying, well, what do you want from me? And he says, I won't let you go unless you bless me. And this is after, note, if any of you are, have ever been wrestlers or grapplers, he touched his hip and it became disjointed. He still wouldn't let, he still wouldn't let Jesus go until he blessed him. And so Jesus blessed him and named him Israel. And we all know from which line Christ should come in the flesh. And so take this, brothers and sisters, away from what I'm saying. When you go to God in prayer, you're entering into battle. You're not, do not pray puff prayers. Do not pray, oh Lord, you know what I mean. I hate that. I've done it. Don't get me wrong. He, know, he knows what I need. He knows what I mean, what I mean. Ah, yes, but shall you be one of the dogs that does not receive a crumb from the master's table? When you pray, pray in battle. Because you're praying also against Satan. You're praying also against the evils of this world. 
when we come together and we pray together and we love one another in prayer, what we're doing is we're calling upon God to bless us. And in that prayer, he answers that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons nor things present nor things to come can separate us from the love that is in Christ Jesus. Jacob wrestled with God and so should we in prayer. When we pray, we should grab God's ankle and let you go until you bless me. And Jesus says, fine, here is my body given for you. Here is my blood shed for you. Here is the washing. If we forget that we have been washed, Arden, if you forget that you have been washed, remember this. When you eat of his flesh and you drink of his blood, you take it with you. Wherever you go, you are blessed when you commune. That is why we should never go a Sunday without communing. That is why we should never go a Sunday without coming to church where there is communion. That is why we should be communing as much as possible. Because where we go, Christ goes with us. Literally, physically, bodily, bloodily. And there can be no greater answer to a prayer than this. I am with you always. Even to the end of the age. And when that time comes... When we let go of God's ankle, we leave this world and we enter rather into his embrace. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have fought the fight. You have ran the race. You have wrestled the wrestle. You have grappled the grapple. Now is the time for your rest. Arden, today you will find that in the bottom of that basin. All your sins drown and die. Come to me. All you who are weary and heavy laden. And I will give you rest. For I am with you always. Even to the end of the age. And that's a promise. That's a promise we should pray for, for everyone. Amen.